Hey there, cats and kitties. I am the Blues Man, Johnny Blues, and with this video, we'll be discussing my thoughts on episode 7 of the anime series Gangsta. And in this episode, we just have a thorough escalation of the four syndicate heads getting at each other's throats in the wake of what is becoming sort of a, a renaissance of tag hunting. And nobody is sure who the hell is behind it. Is it the Corsicans or not? Um, is it the one of the other families, uh, that kind of thing, one of the other heads of the syndicates behind all of this? And uh, you have very much anti-tag sentiments being bandied about within that framework. And it's, you know, the three laws and the entire history of this and, you know, everything coming to the fore. It's almost like history repeating itself along that line, which is very much well-matched by the flashbacks to young Nicholas and Warwick, or Wallace as he was known at the time, um, which is also a situation that is thoroughly escalated from the previous episode to absurdity and madness, where we finally have answers as to you know, why did Nicholas kill Warwick's family? How did he lose his eye in this case? Um, while I am a proponent of uh, non-smoking and everything like that, staying away from that kind of stuff and supporting people who break away from it, who are already uh, had at one time succumbed to it, I don't think I'd ever resort to actually taking a lit cigarette and busting out somebody's eyeball, you know? Um, and it's very intriguing how... Warwick at the time reacted. He was almost acting defensively and he was mad at what Nicholas had done at first because this was his family. For all of that, you know, turmoil he was suffering at the hands of his deadbeat, drunkard, abusive father, you know, all that kind of stuff. It was still his family. It was still his blood and his kin and everything. And his first reaction was to order Nicholas, no, you're going to live. You're not going to take your own life after doing all of this. You're going to spend many days of suffering ahead of this for what you did, to repent for your sins in a sense. And um, it's interesting that because this kind of follows a revelation along the lines of what happened to Nicholas, you know, what happened to his father. His father abandoned him, all but abandoned him, because he was so dependent on the celebra and the drug and everything. He was becoming ill, he had an infection, there was no way they were going to be able to, you know, do anything about it unless somebody came up with the money to get the drugs for him, the medicine for him, and that was Warwick. And we see, you know, this coinciding scene where even Nicholas himself, he's pleading to his father as his father is walking away and just telling him he's garbage, he's useless. He means nothing. He would just be sort of a, you know, ball and chain to have to drag through the mud from here on out. And getting that final jab in, because then we find Warwick has effectively bought off Nicholas from this guy, paid him off and, and gotten the drugs and everything. And I find that really interesting because in that moment, there is this shot of Nicholas, one of the rare occasions where we see him smile. And in this case, as a young boy, in answer to Warwick's promise of your life being better now. Um, and as they quickly, unfortunately, find out, you know, no, things have not changed uh, that tantamount. It's pretty much, you know, uh, same sh different day, you know. Um, still going to be abused, still going to be beaten by people around them and, you know, once you have that curve of Warwick's father taking out his eye, that's finally, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back for Nicholas as a young boy. He just goes on the attack and nothing can stand in his way. He just slaughters everybody in Warwick's own home. And with the exception of Warwick, and when Warwick realizes, and he's kind of skirting madness on his own, like saying, no, I didn't do this, daddy, and all this stuff, like... He almost feels like he's going to be to blame for it until he realizes and catches Nicholas about to impale himself to take his own life after what he did. And here we have just the absolute peak of hell on earth for these two souls, for these two young boys who they've already been forged together, but now they're even more so. It's like now one cannot live or die without the other, you know? And that, to me, is mind-blowing. Um, coinciding with this, we see the modern relationships that both of them share between uh, at least Warwick, the burgeoning relationship between he and Alex, who is kind of trying to sort of be maternal in a way. <laughs> like, he's having nightmares about these past events, and she's like, he wakes up and she's, you know, 
hugging him in bed and everything and saying, well, this is what my mother used to do. And she's trying to be there for him the way he was for her in a sense. I don't necessarily feel that there's any sort of attraction or, or sexual thing going on there. It was simply, you know, I want to thank you and I want to comfort you the way you have tried to do for me. And we see that, you know, she's not in the clear. She's still going to Theo and he's prescribing, uh, like, relaxants for her and, you know, asking her about, have you still been seeing visions? And if you're going to still resume your job as a prostitute, beware of stress and how you can have relapses of these hallucinogenic visions and such. And um, I love the fact that when she goes to, like, thank Theo... The only thanks, the only recompense he wants is for her to stop by every now and then and, like, make up some candy with Nina. And Nina, Nina is a character that just comes to the fore. I've seen fan art um, and Googling images of the characters of this series where there is a closeness depicted between Nina and Nicholas that we haven't thus far seen in the series. And so those scenes sort of, you know, split throughout the first half of the episode where <laughs> he's jumping across across rooftops and holding her all the while doing that it's just i love the strengthening of the bonds of these relationships as it's being depicted so we can understand them a little more and how they are all caring and concerned for each other and how they all interact in this hellish uh, <laughs> you know environment in this city um and the idea that you know with doug he's kind of afraid of nicholas rightfully so but at the same time he kind of admires him he's kind of perturbed by him because he didn't understand he was deaf and all of his words were getting lost on him and all that kind of stuff and uh that they have kind of similar backgrounds from the uh you know south end and west end or whatever they were calling it um and doug feels like kind of taken aback when he finds out that in nicholas case He's the only survivor of this South, uh, whatever it is, South Point or whatever it was, that he's ever heard of or encountered. And that says to me, that's some big doings, <laughs> you know. Um, Nicholas, I like how they kind of refer to it. Uh, I think it's the cop guy whose name escapes me off the top of my head. I think he's like, uh, oh, Chad. He says something about, well, what? You, you don't. Uh, admire your fellow rogue, their rogue tags or whatever it is. And uh, that whole concept of them being on the run, being outcast, we can see exactly why Nicholas behaves the way he does, and Nicholas and Warwick, especially, the, you know, taking the back alleys and everything like that, even amongst their fellow Twilights, uh, you know, Nicholas and Doug, you know, they're kind of under the reign of whoever is commanding them in a sense and uh but at the same time they don't like to follow the rules they make their own rules and so we're seeing very much in the minds of all of these characters meanwhile the backdrop as i say is of these two characters uh erica and mikhail the two children in a sense uh i think it's a young boy and like a teenage girl who are apparently tags in their own right that's you know sort of the speculation they are the ones responsible working for an unseen benefactor who are taking and slaughtering the lives of all of these tags this as i say renaissance of tag hunting come to the fore and uh you have delico going to warwick who's mulling over his past and that question of why you know why are we here why are things the way they are as put to him by alex and he feels he'll never get a straight answer he'll never be able to answer that himself but delico is warning him you know shades of warnings if you will that with this going on all of these high profile high level tags that have been taken out could be potentially precursor to whoever this is angling toward nicholas and of course warwick at first is kind of playfully uh <laughs> sending that pack and like like i care you know like i care about tags just messing with delico because he is a low level tag um but you know that, you know, there is a bond between these characters, as we've seen forged in the last couple of episodes especially. But all through the series, we've seen hints and callbacks to it. Um, and so it's very intriguing that that final shot of the episode after a cat lands on <laughs> Nicholas's head to Alex's delight, you know. And I was actually laughing pretty hard at that too. As well as the idea that Alex, uh, in taking up the sign language, she decides to confront Nicholas and say, Can I please stay with you that much longer? I don't have anywhere to go as yet and I want to try to make my own way. 
but I haven't figured that out yet. And Nicholas, in his own way, he walks off and is like, you got to learn the sign language better. You're butchering it, you know. Don't manhandle the volume. It's the only one I got. And as they're walking past this alleyway, they coincide with this Erica and Mikhail kid going the opposite direction or whatever it is. And Nicholas gets a sense. And you can see that ear-to-ear -ear grin erupt. He knows what's coming. And he's going to get off on it. He's going to be excited by it. You know, this is fun times for him. And it's kind of like what I talked about in my previous episode discussion video <laughs> where that leads me to be fearful of the idea that this can only end penultimately with Nicholas, in a manner of speaking, meeting his own end. And I hope that isn't the case. I want to see these characters continue to grow and everything uh, and, you know, coexist together and become as much of a unit as they can. Um, I've seen fan pages talking about, you know, shipping relationships between Warwick and Alex and Nicholas and Alex and all this kind of stuff. And uh, for my money, I would have put more sort of uh, solid faith in the idea that Alex and Nicholas could become a thing. But as we move forward, I'm, I'm thinking that less and less likely because of, you know, Nicholas still has his holding on to the idea of Veronica, whoever she was, whatever she meant to him, as well as his reckless behavior and his devil-may-care attitude and running into trouble and getting excited by it. Uh, he is a walking time bomb, in a sense, for his own self-destruction. And I think Alex might be better suited to sort of point her attentions toward Warwick, but with the way Warwick is, kind of a gigolo, kind of like uh, very aloof and, you know, realizing the plight that they're in, that this can only end probably badly for all of them. Um, again, that kind of seems less likely as you take that into consideration. So I don't know if there's any uh, even point in shipping characters in this particular show, but it'll be interesting to see how their relationships and their dynamics unfold and evolve as we move on from here. And I can't wait to see what happens. So I'd love to hear from you guys in the comments below what you thought of episode 7 of Gangsta. If you've seen it, if you enjoyed it as much as I did. If not, why not? Let me know in the comments below. I love having the conversation with you guys. And so yeah, otherwise that'll be pretty much it for me on this. Hope this video finds you well. And I'll catch you all later. Peace.